Hey, folks. Hey folks, hopefully now everyone can hear me. Good to see everybody in. Um, by the background that you see behind me, you can tell I'm in my home office, which probably means I'm pixelated like hell. Uh, it's not y'all's fault, it's LinkedIn. Let's all blame them. It's the software we're using. Good news is our guest will look awesome. Um, so you're not missing much. You're, you're missing Sam in a hoodie, go figure. So with that, let's get going and jump right in everybody. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sam Ball, managing partner for 11FS here in North America. Welcome to episode 114 of the 11FS FinTech Insider Breakfast Show. Thank you, COVID, for allowing us to do 114 shows of this. It's like doing a, it's like being on the uh, International Space Station. You just keep rotating the Earth over and over and over again. As you know, in this show, we bring you the best and the brightest from around the fintech and banking landscape every single weekday, straight to your homes at 8:30 British Standard Time. Apart from Mondays and Wednesdays when you get me at 10.30 a.m. Eastern time, if you're wondering what time it is. Both shows go live here on LinkedIn. I also want to highlight the 11FS Daily Brief. We do here on LinkedIn every morning at 8.30 a.m. Eastern time. We post about a five-minute video summarizing three news stories for the past 24 hours that caught our attention and should have yours. Uh, today, I talked about Amazon and their drones. I talked about Walmart going after Amazon Prime. Good luck, Walmart. Um, and a little bit about the job numbers. If you didn't see the ADP reports did come out today, private payrolls rose about 428,000 in August. Um, the expected number was about 1.17 million. So yeah, a little short um, on those numbers, but hey, we're working on it. The interesting part is that big business led the way with that. Roughly of those 428,000 jobs, 298,000 were for big companies. So that's roughly 70%. So small business is still getting hammered, folks. Um, so we'll see whether we're gonna get a V or a K type recovery. All right, with that, let's get our guest on. We are joined by Josh Cyphers. He's the president of Invoice Pay. And Josh has much better bandwidth than I do. He looks nice, he's in a suit. Congratulations, Josh. Today's episode, we'll look at how contactless, we'll, we'll basically look at everything that, um, in invoice pay does. We're going to talk a little bit about Josh's background. We are going to talk about what I think is the most important part of business, which is all the back office stuff personally. And I'm sure Josh would agree. Josh, how you doing? Good. Good morning, Sam. And you're in beautiful, and it is beautiful, Portland, Oregon. Are you not? Yes, I am. How'd it you is like wonderful how here today. How do, you like how do you like how I say Oregon? You can tell yeah. I'm from Detroit <laughs> originally. How do, how do you say it correctly? Oregon. I there wasn't go. going to correct you, though. Yeah, you can correct me. 
I, my pronunciation is horrible. I did say your name right, so that's worth a lot. Josh, why with a with a surname like yours, why did you not go into cybersecurity? <laughs> well, instead, I went into accounting and finance. What the hell? I, you know, you know what? Accounting and finance is important. I don't blame you. Um, I, can we talk a little bit about Portland, if you don't mind? Uh, one heck of a tech hub spot, you know, in my opinion. I think it's a great, so much talent in that town when it comes to fintech technology as a whole. Yeah, we call it Silicon Forest up here. A lot of it spun out of yes, Intel. Man. There's a large Intel presence. Uh, you know, and that that's amazing to me. I didn't realize it was Intel that was big there. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Simple um, was headquartered out of Portland. Yep. Um, you got Nike, obviously. Um, it's, yep. it's, is, it, is that in Portland or is that in Beaverton? I can never remember. It's in Beaverton. That's Beaverton. actually where we're located. But it, Beaverton's just outside of Portland. Okay, there you go, folks. Um, I, sh I should know all this. Um, I've been to Portland before. I absolutely love it. I think it's a great town. I love the, the talent. Like I said, that you can get out of there. Um, and it's just beautiful. I mean, God, it's a beautiful, beautiful place, especially if you like the outdoors. Um, so, Josh, let's talk a little bit about your background before we get um, into the company itself. Um, you you are somewhat of a local talent, are you not? <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I'm a former CPA, um, was accounting student of the year at my, my university. Wow. Did you get a trophy for that? I, I did get a plaque and a pen, oh, so that was pretty cool. Awesome. Okay. Um, but I, I, I'm according to the state of Oregon, I'm actually a C lapsed CPA, so I haven't kept up my CPE. It hasn't really been my passion. I've been more drawn to to software and technology. Just out of curiosity, why? I mean, what is it about it? Especially if you went through all the work of getting you know, certified, which is a ton of work, you know, it to was be a, a CPA. Yeah. I think it was just, there were so many problems to solve. Man, With accounting, all those problems have been solved by the regulatory boards. And so you're just following the rules. I like, I like not having rules and, and being mm -hmm. able to come up with solutions independent of those rules. That's, and I love hearing a CEO or, a, you know, a president of a company say that, that uh, I don't like rules because I know that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you're, you're slightly exaggerating, but still, um, that is refreshing to hear someone who's running the company say that. Um, so, you know, your background is, is really interesting. You know, you like I said, you've done stints at Nike. It's, you know, as, as you would expect. But, um, you know, you've been with Invoice Pay now for a while. I mean, it's, this isn't new. You didn't walk in right as president. Right, right. Actually started out in finance at Invoice Pay. And so what, what intrigued you about joining Invoice Pay? What was it? Well, I have a bit of a fintech background. I spent, I think, about six years at what's Fiserv's Digital yeah. Channels today. Helped start that division or when it was a separate company from the ground up. So know quite a bit about fintech, pretty passionate about it. But also given my CPA background, I've managed accounts payable. I've had close family members who have worked in accounts payable. And that's really where Invoice Pay got its start, was trying to help the accounts payable teams. So, so Josh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this, and I'd love to get your opinion on it. Um, I think the most exciting part of fintech is everything that's underneath the glass. And I'm holding up mm. my phone for everybody. In other words, all of the plumbing, all of the stuff that, all the back office, all the stuff that actually makes it work, right? Uh, in my opinion, yeah. I think that to me is the most exciting part and where the most need is in reality. Right. right. I mean, and you know this. It's that's just, where the true magic lies, right? And yep. when the user doesn't feel that, intensity or that magic within like then you know you've created the magic yeah and when it really is seamless right i'll say that yeah. stupid word ubiquitous but hey it's a word <laughs> here all the time because you and i you know came out of the industry but i agree with you i think when you have solutions like that so what y'all do what like encino does um i'm i'm very bullish on companies that address that so if you don't mind let's talk about what is the mission of invoice pay if y'all can't figure out from the name of the company <laughs> Yeah, really what we're trying to do is solve the problems of accounts payable and enterprise payment automation. Really, there's so many different things that accounts payable people have to deal with. And a lot of times these are lower paid staff members that, that really just don't have the bandwidth or the, the experience or skill sets to handle some of the bigger complex issues that, that accounts payable is facing. And quite frankly, as a former, what I would call failed CFO, I know how important it is for your most liquid asset to go out and, and go out incorrectly. So I know the risk associated with, you know, that 
the cash that goes out through accounts payable. Man, and, and Josh, I want you to preach a little bit, especially like we said, we got a good audience that's on this morning. Um, one of the things I am really worried about, um, especially thank you to COVID for doing this, but is the impact to small businesses across the US, right? Such a vital part of our economy. And at the end of the day, cash flow is everything, is it not? I mean, right. that it's life and death for these companies. And yeah. um, you know, if you are spending a ton of your time, I, I like to I like to give the quote that one of the co-founders of Cabbage always used to say, um, what Rob Froline would say, uh, the thing at Cabbage we do is we let bakers bake, which I think is a great quote, right? Um, allow them to focus on what they really need to do. And I, that's my assumption with invoice pay is you're allowing them to focus where their specialty is and, mm -hmm. and not at what it takes when it comes around AP and the invoice side. Well, and there's so many mundane and repetitive tasks with AP and that's exactly right, Sam. That's what we're trying to take out for them so they can focus and really manage the cash and, and, and make sure that the cash is going to the appropriate people and at the appropriate time, especially in COVID cash management is so critical. And you were mentioning that, you know, and it was interesting to hear what you said about the, the jobs numbers and how that's mostly large companies. I am concerned a lot of companies, you know, given the financial uncertainty and the economic environment we're in, a lot of companies are conserving cash and extending payment terms to suppliers. Yep. A lot of those suppliers are small businesses. Man, thank you for bringing that up. That is an incredibly important point. Um, I, I've been talking about this repeatedly on that breakfast brief I do. It goes out at 8.30 a.m., everybody, here on LinkedIn. It's crazy. I dress up like a T-Rex. I did before. Um, one of the most important parts is, is cash flow when it comes to small businesses. But I love what you just said because we are seeing payments delayed, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it just is. The larger companies actually can get away with it. And yeah. uh, that is just – if you don't have – as I don't care what size company you are, is you are, if, if you don't have a great view of your cash flow when payments are due, if you don't have a great overview of AP, you will not make it. Period. Right. So, yeah. so what's the, what's the secret sauce and what y'all do? <laughs> well, I would say it's our cloud-based software, anytime, anywhere. Yeah. Um, payment approvals and workflows for CFOs who don't want to sign checks and have their staff stuff envelopes and, and mail them out, especially in this time. Um, but but what makes it, us unique to the rest of the industry or anybody else kind of helping with electronic payments or digital payments is our comprehensive services. So we spend a lot of time around indemnifying payments, making sure the payments go into the right suppliers, um, and then following up on any issues. A lot of times AP will spend 80% of their time on 5% of the, the, the payments that went through oh, an error. When amen. it goes through the process just fine, no time is required. So those exceptions that cause a lot of the time and, and disruption in AP. And, and it really is, right? I mean, that's that's where the magic is for any solution provider is it's really not even an 80-20 rule, right? It's about a 90-95 to 5 um, rule, but you spend a ridiculous amount of your time in those exceptions. And that that's where the time is spent. And the more you can um, automate that, the more data that you can provide in real time, to understand that, the better of a solution you're going to be provided. Yeah, we've seen it. up to 20% error rates, 5 to 10% in payment error rates, and in our historic error rates are less than 1%. I think it's even less than 0.1%. And the beauty is that we may still have an error rate, but we handle it. So we don't ask the customer to go back and manage it. We take care of it ourselves. Yeah, can you talk? Can you expand on that? Because that's actually an incredibly important point. So you you, yeah. you actually service that account. Yeah, and, and that's oh. another part of our comprehensive services. And we don't just focus on the AP teams. We also focus on their suppliers. Because ultimately, if the suppliers aren't having a good experience, aren't receiving their payments, don't have visibility oh, into the payments, they're going to be calling your AP team anyway, right? right. And so a big part of taking that burden off the AP team is to run, run interference or at least support those suppliers. And we actually track supplier satisfaction. I think that's a real important part of our engagement. And I think that helps small businesses. So many of our clients are larger corporates yeah. that many of their suppliers are smaller businesses and, and and we constantly help them whether it's payment method update to address update to bank banking information whatever it is we help su support that and, and we make sure that gets taken care of for the ap team uh, and you already got a great question from a company founder and and i i i should actually put money down on how fast it's going to take Siddharth to ask a good question so hey <laughs> Siddharth. so you got a, a company founder um in tech in san francisco asking this so I want to give you a compliment. Very nice solution to a problem that's been staring us in the face all this time. So kudos. So two questions. One, what happens if a supplier isn't in your network? So I'll let you answer that one first. 
Yeah, so we, we do constant supplier enablement. So we do outreach and calling campaigns and mailing campaigns, and we, we continuously add suppliers to our network every day. Okay, so there you go, so that makes sense. And then secondly, do you help suppliers with smart invoicing, given what you know about payer history and analytics? We, so we don't do much on the invoicing side yet. That's kind of something we're looking at because I think we could extend the services we have and the technology yeah. we have to really help with that invoicing process. We're focused on the payments and that's where we got our start was payment automation. And we wanted to nail that first before we extend it into invoicing. And that's actually one of the most important things, right? Um, <laughs> focus on what you're trying to solve um, with, without expanding that, that footprint too big. Yeah, because I mean, it, it gave you a you know, great you know, suggestion when you're looking at analytics on payment history. So payers that pay on time versus payers that don't, you know, and what you're seeing, that type of feedback going to a company is fantastic. So yeah. add it to the roadmap. <laughs> pretty good to go. Um, you guys were acquired too, not that long yeah. ago, right? A little over a year ago, acquired by Fleet Corps. Um, and, and what was that experience like? I know it was going to say great because obviously it was, but um, that's, that's a recognition of a really good solution, especially Fleet Corps. They're not small. Yeah, because that's what, what was um, most memorable about, about being acquired was just how much value they saw in our solution. Yeah. We're, we've always historically been very self critical. Um, and just focus on the things we don't do well because we just wanted to improve. And, and to have somebody like Fleet Corps who's really grown and, and, and had a yeah. ton of success in M&A and, and, and acquiring companies come by and, and kind of validate the value of our solution and the uniqueness of our solution will, really was pretty rewarding in itself. I will yeah. say it wasn't all, it wasn't all, it wasn't a cakewalk by any means um, out the gate, right? Like we have, yeah. we had to work through, you know, what makes the most sense between the two companies, how we kind of move together. But I think we're getting close and I think we're, we're really, we have a really comprehensive strategy now around corporate payments, which is pretty exciting. And we play strongly into that. Yeah, and, I, and I'm glad you said that. I mean, anybody that talks through an acquisition and how you integrate the solutions and, and how you set the teams up and everything else that says it was just the easiest thing in the world, just lying through their teeth. I don't care who um, you are or who you were acquired by. But I will say as someone who's been in the industry a long time, the fact that it was Fleet Corps, um, that's fantastic. That's, that's a great recognition of the solution that you guys provide and the services you provide. And, um, and there are huge benefits on our side. Yeah. We've always been this small, low cap company. We were actually just going out to raise funds because we were looking to accelerate our growth. And we really had broad spread, rapid adoption of our solution and needed more capital. Um, now we've got Fleet Corps behind us. And they're very yeah. interested in hearing from us, very interested in investing in our initiatives. So it's really accelerated our growth and given us an opportunity to go into the, the things we, we, we want to do next. So, uh, uh, man, you got questions flying in like crazy, Josh. So I'm going to slaughter your name and I apologize. Janine, I believe I said that right. She said with more financial institutions moving to RTP platforms, so real-time payments, folks, mm -hmm. um, and like the clearinghouse and eventually fed now. And when I, you say eventually fed now, you're not kidding everybody. Uh, so in 10 years, when FedNow comes out with their own invoice to pay solutions, how are you going to differentiate yourself against those embedded solutions? Good question. So, yeah, I mean, and again, we do payment automation today because there are a lot of payment problems. I would say the risk and security around ensuring your payments going to the right vendors won't be completely solved just by real-time payments. Right. It may even be heightened as a concern, as we saw with ACH. Banks and, and, and companies, you know, and controllers were getting a lot of the protection and security in place on check. And when they moved to ACH, what we saw was actually an increase in the amount of fraud instances on B2B payments yeah. because of ACH. So these, these kind of faster, more seemingly digital or automated methods of payment won't necessarily solve all your problems. In fact, a lot of times it introduces problems you hadn't, hadn't even thought of. I'm, I'm smiling, Josh, because if anybody in our audience isn't aware, um, our friends at City did a $900 million payment mistake. When it came to wow. if you all weren't aware of it. Yeah, so City um, was paying some of the lenders for Revlon, so the big uh, makeup company. Uh, great story, everybody. Go out and Google this one. You won't believe me. We'll make a great movie. But uh, they were only supposed to be paying the interest on the money that was outstanding, and instead they actually paid out $900 million incorrectly. <laughs> they, needed oh, invoice. they needed your solution so bad, Josh, so you need to reach out to the City. Um, they're desperately trying to recoup that money. And as you can imagine, that means lawsuits at this point. Um, yeah. <laughs> a lot of times companies don't get it back. And I hear it every oh, no. day. I talk to a lot of CFOs. And I've, I've had my own experiences managing AP. 
when money goes out, especially by ACH, you're lucky if you get it back. Uh, and when it's nine hundred million dollars, <laughs> right? Uh, I just, I'm sorry, folks. Just go Google that story. Uh, it's, it is unbelievable. That tells you we're talking someone at the scale of City making right. that mistake. So it, it happens. You know that is reality. Um, so here you go. I got to do this question because it comes from Dr. Abdullah out in Saudi Arabia, and I told you. We get good questions, man. Josh, you're going to have a global audience. Is your system considered a straight through payment processing gateway? Or is your system embedded with like ERP systems to enable the accounts to settle B2B payments without having to log in online banking systems, stuff like that? Yeah, no banking systems are involved. So we go straight from the ERP though. So they can serve up their payments in the ERP, send it over to us and we take care of the rest. We send data, remit rich remittance and the payment in whatever method is most beneficial to the customer and the supplier. Um, with with no no other touch from the customer. Excellent. All right. So let's let's talk briefly about COVID because we have to. Right. We're all living through this um, every day. I live in Florida. I think everyone knows that. So I have been through the Wild West. What's it like in Oregon, by the way? How's it How's it been out there? It's a little hectic. I don't know if yeah. you follow the news on Portland. Yeah. Portland yeah. It's had a sort of disruption. Yeah. Downtown. Yeah, which, and again, I'll say it's somewhat sad because it is a great city. It really yes. is. Um, it, it, and yeah, it's, it's, we'll just leave it there. It's a great city. But how's the demand for contactless payments changed in the B2B space thanks to COVID? Yeah, it's, <laughs> we've really <laughs> had a hard time keeping up with it, honestly. Hey, excellent. More than 100% growth, more than doubling from last year. So wow. new business has really taken off. And, and I think everybody started to realize, wow, my, my legacy accounts payable processes and quite frankly, internal controls are a little outdated, a little too dependent on physical presence. And so how do we figure this thing out? And thankfully we've been able to help them figure it out and get them a solution that minimizes the amount of in office work needed. Um, and, and I'm curious for the, for your clients and who you work with your customers, how are they adapting, especially when it comes to cloud-based payment systems, which I, is hilarious that it's 2020 and I'm still asking that. <laughs> first one. Yeah, I would say the first thing is when COVID hit, we started talking to a lot of companies out there asking how they were adapting and, and what they were doing. And really their focus was just getting remote work set up. Yeah. So getting computers in place, getting telephony in place, that sort of thing, video conferencing, all that. They hadn't really had time to focus on internal controls, which is a big disruption because just like in IT, you kind of think about the, the moat and gate defense. Yep. AP internal controls mostly were designed around physical presence. You have files in the file cabinet. You, you walk checks over to the CFO to sign. You stuff the checks in another room. So it was really centered around physical presence. And what we've heard from most is they've been able to get their folks remote. Um, what ends up happening still, though, is that one, one or two people have to come in to the office to collect the mail, open the mail, and process what paper they still get today. Um, but they haven't nailed down their internal controls and really yeah. figured out how am I making sure that, you know, my, my AP manager isn't going to the gym with all of our invoices or check payments in her car. Right. Yeah. Not to mention sitting at home and whatever lack of cybersecurity they have at home or in Starbucks while they're logged in trying to make payments. You know, I'll tell you one of the thing I think is fascinating that we've seen um, over the past couple of months and, and the shift into into digital and remote and everything else we all know it's just been tremendous right uh, uh that, that's been you know we've, we've realized we can work from home we've realized we can do this the things that we've been dodging forever and a day across multiple verticals i'll give you an example my son um had a, a weird rash on his elbow and uh um, when we called the the doctor they're just like okay let's, let's go to a video call and they're able to diagnose and get you know what i mean and and actually you had to have laws passed that allowed them to do that right by the yeah. way which got yeah. ran through and are sure great. And hopefully we'll see those long-term, you know, effects that be adopted and it'll stay that way. So I'm curious from your standpoint, when you look at the pandemic and what's happened, how do you think this is going to change the industry when it comes to invoicing and AP? Yeah, I think there are going to be some fundamental changes that Thank kind God. of stick. Yeah. And we've seen it over time. You can see studies that show, I mean, it's, it's amazing to me that still over 40% of B2B payments are made by check. Oh my God. Uh, for our international audience at check, is this paper? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let me clarify. In the U.S., over 40% of payments, yeah. B2B payments are still made by check. And we've seen this kind of slow transition for the last 10 years. Maybe that went from 60 to 40, but it hasn't really accelerated. There's been no compelling event. 
here comes the compelling event, right? We're seeing yeah. that acceleration. It's not just the AP teams who want to make those digital payments because it creates the efficiency, but suppliers need the digital payment. Your AR teams can't go into the office and get paper checks, right? And go deposit them. So they're the ones really pushing for the demand of more electronic or digital payment methods. Yeah, I, I, I'm glad <laughs> we joke around about that. The U.S. is unique, folks. I we mean, are, it, yeah. Yeah, but that said, um, you know, the the sheer volume that we've seen in the equivalent of e-commerce that has taken place just over the past few months. Um, and the people that were winners in that, by the way, I've talked about mm -hmm. this in that morning brief I've done, right? Where basically six retailers own, you know, over 30% of all retail sales. You know, Target, Walmart, Home Depot, Lowe's, the ones that were preparing all along for digital and, you know, electronics or dominated. So the same is going to be true, with, I, th I believe, especially in the U.S. with small businesses, solution providers like yourself that can step in and, and do that work for your clients. Um, I looked I looked at your at uh, on your site. And I was looking at your, your you know, the clients that you work with, um, you know, uh, so many of them I consider to be cutting edge, too, which I love. Um, folks, you can go out and look. I'm not going to name any names. Go out and look. They're, they're great names. So congratulations, Josh. Um, on that, it's, it's great to see the business growing like this. I mean, what's next for y'all? What, what's coming well, down the road? We talked a little bit about it before. There's so much more we can do to support AP teams. Yeah. And really, we don't look at it in just AP. We've already established good relationships with the AP suppliers or on the AR side. So mm -hmm. there's so much we can do in the whole exchange between AP and AR around invoicing, around procurement. There's just so many more opportunities beyond payment that we can help in that exchange. Yeah, it, it, it's uh, it's a space that has definitely needed help and modernization. Um, it's great to see a company like yours that uh, is getting the recognition in the client base and the adoption that is so desperately needed. Um, if we could kill checks, I'd be so damn happy, personally. Uh, oh, my God, that would be nice. We'll see. Um, and believe it or not, we're up against the clock. Dude, you see how fast this goes? It is really ridiculous. Fast. That's why I've done 114 of these because they only take great conversations. <laughs> they take no time. Um, okay. That's good and important stuff uh, for the folks that are watching this, especially some of these small business owners. What's the best way for them to learn more about the company and get in contact with you? Invoicepay.com. That was way too easy. Uh, or go to Portland or Beaverton, guys. It's really or come nice. Out to Beaverton and visit us. Yeah. Oh my God, I would go anywhere right now. I haven't been on a plane since February. I don't know about you, but oh my God. <laughs> it's been yeah. a while. It would be nice. All right, everybody. Thanks for joining. Um, if you want to reach out to me, Sam Mall on Twitter, Sam at 11FS. You can just send me an email or you can just reach out to our producers. Same thing. Uh, that's it for me. Tomorrow, David Brer will be on at 3.30 in the morning Eastern time. So I'm sure so many of you will be joining that conversation. But hey, uh, you can go to our YouTube channel and see all of these, by the way. So they are evergreen and you can go out and see them. Thanks for joining, everybody. And for those that show up, we'll see you tomorrow.